So here's what happened. <clears throat> uh, about five to 7,000 years ago, these small bands of hunter-gatherers began to coalesce into chieftains and states. As long as the numbers are small, informal means of behavior control and moral enforcement operate quite well. As soon as the numbers are too large for these informal means, shunning, making people feel guilty, gossiping about them, making them feel embarrassed for their bad behavior, as soon as the populations are big, there's too much opportunity for free riding and for cheating the system and taking advantage of it and getting away with it. So two institutions evolved, government to set up a set of rules and everybody gets a copy, and religion, in case you think you got away with it, you didn't because there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all and keeps track of this. So this is the second part of how humans construct religions and gods because we need it for moral enforcement. It just so happens by contingency and chance, religion and government was the first on the scene. Now what's happened in the last several centuries since the Enlightenment, in addition to the trajectory that Professor Krauss outlined for you, science displacing religion as the primary means of explaining how the world works, something else has also happened. We've slowly but ineluctably replaced religion as the primary source of our morals and, and came up with the clever idea that you actually have to have a reason why you have uh, certain moral principles and we're going to write certain laws. You actually have to give evidence for why you think this is a good law or a bad law or a good moral principle or a bad moral principle. And that has been the trajectory of the Enlightenment since um, about 200 years ago. And so again, what's more likely that um, one of them happens to be the one true religion and the one true God and all those others that have been constructed are false gods or that as we can clearly see anthropologically, social, socially, social, psychologically, and so on. This is what people do to get along. They construct religions, they construct moral systems, and so on. We now know that we can do this without gods. In fact, we do it quite well without gods. Northern European countries do just fine with much lower rates of religiosity than we have. It is possible to do that, and that is what we've been doing. According to UNICEF, about 29,000 children under the age of five die each day, mainly from preventable causes. That's 21 dead children every minute, 10.6 million a year. That's the equivalent of a Holocaust every year. More than 70% of these 10.6 million children deaths every year are attributable to six causes, diarrhea, malaria, neonatal infection, pneumonia, preterm delivery, or lack of oxygen at birth. Science's response is, well, give them those things. Religion's response is, those are part of God's plan. Really? What kind of plan is that? What kind of God, who is all-powerful and all-good, would not stop that? Now, I'm not talking about homicides, gang warfare, civil wars and strife in Syria. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about innocent children who have no free will. They're not freely choosing to die from horrible diseases and cancer. Why would God allow that to happen? An all-powerful, all-good God? A less-than-powerful or not-so-good God? Or no God at all? The problem with explaining evil for religious people, for theists, is what I call the irrefutable God problem. When good things happen, who gets the credit? God did it works in wonderful ways. He's answered my prayers. He made a miracle. When bad things happen, who gets the blame? Not God. Or, he works in mysterious ways, don't you know? What does that even mean? So no matter what happens, the God hypothesis is confirmed. What would disconfirm the God hypothesis? Good things happen, so God is. Bad things happen, so God is. What would have to happen to refute this causal explanation of evil? In the Christian worldview, nothing can refute it. It's irrefutable. It's a simple assertion. It's true by asserting, I hereby say it's true. And that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. The solution to this evil we are told, is to accept the sacrifice of the deity, which exonerates you from anything you did in your life, no matter how evil it might have been. 
Just think about that. You could be a serial killer on death row in Texas and find Jesus. This happens, don't you know? As it happens, I've read all 414 final statements of the executed prisoners in the state of Texas for a research project I'm doing. And uh, about 90% of them found Jesus in, in, uh, in prison. Not surprising, there's a big Christian ministry there. Are we to believe that these men, if they accept Jesus at the last moment, after the brutal crimes that they committed, they, they get to go? And Jews don't? Muslims don't? Native Americans never heard of Jesus before Europe, Europeans came here? They don't get to go? What about the hundred billion people that lived before us? Before Jesus, it was about 90 billion. They don't get to go to heaven. It's just the way it goes, too bad. They didn't accept Jesus. This makes Christianity something of a cult of human sacrifice, but instead of the sacrifice of children or beasts of burden as practiced by primitive religions, it's the updated 2.0 version. The sacrifice of one child, the son of God. This brings up my last point, my opening statement. So, David, I presume you are a monotheist. Christians are monotheists. God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, and so forth. We were created sinless because God gave us free will. And Adam and Eve chose to eat from the tree of knowledge and so forth. We're born with original sin. Okay, first of all, this goes against the all Western jur jurisprudence. You are responsible for your own sins, not anybody else's. And you are beholden and should be sorry to the people you harmed, not somebody else. Still, God could just forgive the sin we never committed, but instead he sacrificed his son Jesus, who is actually just himself in the flesh, because Christians are monotheists. So this violates the law of identity, A is A, a cannot be non-A at the same time. So the only way to avoid eternal punishment for sins we never committed from this all-loving God is to accept his son, who's actually himself, as our savior. So my final sentence. So God sacrificed himself to himself to save us from himself. This is barking mad. Where do we get our morals from? Um, it, it can't be from the Bible because almost nobody obeys, certainly not the Old Testament, and, and most of the New Testament. I mean, death penalty for adultery, there goes half a Congress. I mean, mm. nobody, <laughs> nobody is going to do this, right? So we pick and choose, we cherry pick from the, the holy books based on something else, something else that's happened that I referenced in my opening statement of there's been this other change that's happened, this secularization of morality. That is, you have to actually have good reasons for why you hold certain moral principles, and you, better, and you should be able to articulate them. Uh, and so that's been the, the change there. So even if you and I both listen to the still small voice within to decide what's right or wrong, Dinesh, um, I'm claiming you're not getting it from the Bible, and I'm not either. We're getting it from somewhere else. I think we've evolved this propensity to have moral emotions, and then culture tweaks them, and we've been getting progressively more but, moral. But like a popular thing at Skeptic Magazine is psychics and people that can telekinetically move objects with their mind or so on. And there's an example of this where there's a man who can move the cursor on his computer just by thinking about it. Now, it turns out he's a quadriplegic and he has a chip in his brain uh, that enables him to do this. But if you don't know about the chip, it looks like a miracle. Once you know the technology, it's no longer miraculous. This is Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I contend that there's no such thing as the supernatural or the paranormal. There's just the natural, the normal, and the stuff we haven't explained yet. When something unusual like that happens, we should go searching for the mechanism behind it. Is there a chip in the brain? So if, it, if it's true that, say, God heals cancers or whatever due to prayer, this should be a measurable thing. 